So we have Ned Mueller today joining us on this uh, wonderful presentation and talk. And if you're listening or you're watching, depends on what you're doing. Um, we just, we're just we're super happy to, to have Ned here uh, with us today. Uh, he's joining us from his uh, studio in Renton, Washington. Thanks, Ned, for coming. Hi, Gabor. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah. So today's topic is, is about... Uh, getting ready for a, for a painting, and in particular, when um, it's figures, when you have multiple figures, that's, that's the topic, and what, what happens, how, how do you prepare Ned for, uh, for working with, uh, with multiple figures? How does a painting with multiple figures happen for you? What is your uh, process, if you can share that with, with us? Yeah, uh, I usually, I, I'll have a whole bunch of photos, like either from a trip to Mexico or India, China, wherever I go, I'll take multiple photos. I used to paint on location in the marketplaces, places like that, great place to get material and figures, uh, but it got to be too much. Just mobs of people surround me and people are moving. so. The only solution there was to just take a lot of photos. And plus, well, if you were set up uh, doing a painting, you know, a whole carnival, and, <laughs> like being on a movie set, people coming and going, it was just delightful. So, and I painted from life enough that I can take those photos and adjust them. You know, so the photos, usually the darks are too dark, the lights are too light, the uh, Colors and values are off. So I have these groups of photos, and I'll go through them, and I'll look and try to see something that gets me excited. You know, an interesting setting, an interesting costume that the figure might have. Uh, could be set in a flower market. Could be set in a, something like an Indian uh, – being in India, in India, uh, camel fair where there's animals around and stuff like that. So I'll kind of lay them all out and put them together and look at them and, you know, try to get some idea of, you know, what can I do to get an interesting, you know, compelling uh, painting out of this. And I'll also I'll have figures and I'll have photos of, Fruits and vegetables, dogs, you know, cats, chickens, um, flowers, you know, all that stuff around that I can kind of try to work it so I can make a very interesting painting. And trying to think the, the design part, kind of an abstract approach. You know, maybe just start out with one figure and then figure, okay, I can place a figure behind the person, place a figure next to it. Uh, should I crop, you know, the figure off? Uh, and it's just a kind of a mismatch, a lot of fun trying to organize it. You know, it's, it's I, w I was lucky because I was trained that way too. And that's my question, actually, Ned. Do, do you use, um, how do you, I mean, how do you draw, do you draw this out? Do you use Photoshop? Do you use, you know, what, what do you do to, to, to lay it out? Yeah, good, good question. I, I guess I was going to get to that. <laughs> that's okay. Maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit. That's why we have you, Gabor, to get us on the right track. <laughs> uh, yeah, people tell me I'm around other artists, and I do have Photoshop, but they said, Ned, you don't need it because my training was what Photoshop does. They trained us to take things and put them together like that because they didn't have Photoshop there. We just had photos to work from or what we call a morgue, pictures from all sorts of stuff. Or we went out, we got an assignment, 
And then we went out or did studies and then got something going, then went out actually and would hire models with costumes or pose ourselves and put the stuff together. So we were trained with Photoshop is in my head. So it, it really helps. Uh, it's the same process, except I'm just laying it out and doing it all in my studio without any kind of aids. I'm doing little value studies, you know, you know, figuring out a design where I'm going to arrange darks and lights and midtones. You know, I'll do 25 or 30 value studies and getting some ideas, you know, different subjects. Some of them work out, some of them don't. And then I'll pick out maybe the 10 best that maybe do some color studies. And maybe the five best of those will go into more finished paintings. It, it is a lot of work, and I, and I kind of enjoy it. I enjoy that process. It's, uh, and, you know, because I'm organizing everything, and plus, once I have it down to, say, five color studies, they're probably pretty, I'm pretty happy with them. And so a lot of the work is done. All I have to do is kind of execute it. The problem there is if you're doing value studies, then color studies, then a finished painting, you're, it's a lot of work and you're kind of going through it three times. You're playing the ball game three times. So it's okay if you're probably not used to doing that, you work things out in a value study, color study. But after a while, you could probably skip either the value study or the color study. Usually now I'll just go into a, a color study. And sometimes I'll just do a value study. It, it just, it just kind of depends. Uh, but it but, still starts with a, with a pencil study though. I mean, does it still fundamentally kind of the drawing study? Yeah. And, and don't, yeah. I don't refer, be careful not to refer to this pencil because when I'm doing a value study, I'm, I don't usually work with pencil because it, it forces you to tighten up. Mm -hmm. I'll either use a, uh, Conti charcoal, or just a three or four value study. And I have examples that I can show. Uh, because you want to think of shapes. Okay. Pencils tend to, you start thinking of detail. And that's the last thing you want to do, because what you're thinking of is the design. You want to be able to think of shapes and values. And if you're doing color, color. Uh, so you're, you're thinking broadly. You're thinking of how these arrangements of shapes and colors work together, ignoring the little stuff because that's not important. That's just, that's just touching the painting up. So, and that's the most problem people have. I've been teaching for over 50 years, and they really have trouble sitting down and simplifying things because they start noodling or getting detail. And the whole purpose of these studies is to work out that composition and design. And details gets in the way. And, uh, and people can get beyond that because generally that is, that's your painting, those big arrangements of shapes and colors. That's what people see across the room. That's what attracts people. Certainly detail is nice and a, a, a great addition, but the bigger structure of a painting to most of us is what's important. You know, that, that concept, that design. So no, no amount of good color uh, and even drawing uh, or value can save a, a bad design, right? Kind of in essence, that's... Pretty much, wow. you know. Uh, you know, I think, and also you find out it's, it gets to be about judgment. And that's why I always stress drawing. Not that you have to draw the figure. I mean, uh, all drawing is is developing your judgment, your taste your sense of what's right and wrong. You know, whether a head is too, too narrow or too wide, 
a building is too short or a tree is too tall or too fat. Drawing is the easiest thing to develop your judgment. You're always doing that when you're painting too. We're making thousands of decisions of that. But the drawing, and it's a little easier for some of us to say that because I love to draw. And it just sharpens my judgment. And the better I can draw or the better I can judge, you know, whether a nose is placed right or a head is shaped wrong or a horse is shaped wrong. The more I do that, the more I, I sharpen my judgment, the better my paintings get, the better my sense of design, what looks right and what looks wrong, and also what works for me. Everybody's different. So it gets complicated, but, you know, I think that's the best way I can explain it. Um, you might even have something to add yourself, Gabor, in regards to that. No, no, I think you're, you're saying it well. Um, again, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see some imagery up right now. If you're listening um, uh, on a podcast, uh, you might want to hop over to YouTube and see some of these images up. Um, what, uh, so, you, so you have your – what size are these uh, studies generally? What's your philosophy on, on these studies? Uh, Usually, usually I don't make them any larger than 8 by 10. Okay, why? Why is that? Uh, well, it's so hard to do. It's, it's it, smaller, you can do them quicker, and you can get a, a better sense of the relationships of shapes and values. Yeah, that's a great, great uh, question. Oh. Because, it, and if you're working large, you might as well go on ahead and do it. Yeah. Big painting, but this idea, and it's and working small, you it's you haven't got so much at risk. You know, you can do or do a little six by eight color value study in 20 minutes, half an hour, or an hour. You know, uh, and if you're working larger, you may you're just covering trying to cover a lot of ground when when small is just good enough. Okay, so uh, you're saying. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding correctly that um, a design in an eight by ten, even let's say a six by eight, should hold, sh should work in a larger format. Meaning, if it doesn't work in an eight by ten format, the design a heck of, I mean, there's a high chance it will not work in a thirty by forty. Is that kind of the idea too? It's not going to get better because it's larger. Is is that am I? Am I? Yeah, yeah, yes and no. I mean, there's, yeah. I'm talking about design, just design, just yeah. shapes and design, yeah. not talking about anything else. Yeah, you're looking at arrangements of shapes and values and colors if you're doing a color study. Yeah. Um, but even when you do a larger one, some areas that look good, small, you may have to do something in the larger one. And like if you have a big area of uh, grasses or water, say in the foreground, a big area, maybe dominates a third of the painting. And it looks good in a small one, but when you get it large, all of a sudden that bigger area can look kind of boring. Mm -hmm. So you may have to go in and texture it or arrange things. Uh, I'm I've done so much painting, I'm kind of aware of that even when I'm doing the small ones. Mm -hmm. And I think the more you do that, you become a, and you take a small one and do a large one, and you say, well, then that doesn't work so well. So next time you do some color studies, you may, may develop that area just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. so it looks good. So it's, yeah. Like everything else, it's not a perfect system. Yeah. But, you know, through the years, artists have been doing these things. You know, the problem is you never hardly ever see them because they're, nobody sees them. You're in, they're in their studio. You, you've, you've got, oh, I've got all these thousands of value studies and hundreds of color studies laying around here. Uh, I will 
sometimes finish them off and sometimes I love them so much and, and I'll finish them off and put them in a show or I'll take them to workshops and my students love them and they, they'll buy it because the studies, you know, they're like a plain air painting. They're usually fresh, you know, and you're, you can see the artist's mind. You can see what he's thinking, what he's doing. Because more of a finished studio painting, which you see in galleries, museums, it's hard to imagine what that is, but you can bet an awful lot that some of those better paintings, they were done that way. Even sculptures, look at sculptures. You go to Florence and places like that, you'll see all these beautiful little maquettes, they call them. The little studies that sculptures do before they do a big one. So I know it, it may not be for everybody. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot to be said for being spontaneous and just laying it down and presenting it with warts and everything. There's a lot to be said for that. You know, but this, this process is more for, you know, doing more finished, a chance to more thought out paintings for those of us that like to do that. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are great answers. There is no, that's, that is true. There's not, it's not a formula. You're not, you're not working by, uh, by a formula. What happens after you get your initial design done? You're happy with, with, with um, what you got going on. Uh, do you, how do you transfer it on to the canvas? What, what happens uh, next? Or well, yeah, I'll just, I'll just set it up near my easel. And then I'll, to say the photographs I work for are from the reference, I'll have that. And I'll just, take, uh, I'll just take that small study and use it, and I'll just, I'll just block in those big major shapes. And I, you know, I do that you know, very broadly. I'm thinking uh, there the other thing is working from big to small. I'm trying to get the big relationship between a figure and a wall or a window and all that. But that's why I have that study there. So I can draw in and uh, compose those things pretty easily because it's, I've already worked a lot of stuff out in the study. And usually, like I say, I have to make some changes just because it just when you do enlarge things, things do change. So I may have to take something out or I may have to add something. Uh, you know, maybe, and, and that's where we have our imagination. Yeah. You know, we need to use our imaginations. We all have them, but, and of course, <laughs> when we didn't have Photoshop and the internet, we had to use our imaginations. We had no other recourse. Yeah. So what, yeah. you develop it, and that's where the imagination comes in in the study, but it comes in the larger painting too. And that's why I think the, uh, the uh, concept artists are really imaginative. Uh, they have to be because they're creating worlds that are not, we don't see them. I enjoy looking at, at, at that. As, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't do that, but concept artists for movies and what have you, yeah. they, they need to be imaginative, even for cartoons or whatever. They, they need, they're creating worlds that do, do not exist. Yeah. And, I think it's it, led, it led me right into that, Gabor, because oh. I did a lot of that for Disney. Well, I, actually, we, we, we don't have a script here. I don't have any kind of script for any of these recordings, but uh, yeah. that's... That, 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 did yeah. I pay you for that, or did... Uh, that's just uh, what happens when, uh, when you're... Uh, you're <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I did, I'm into... I've never studio. seen you at loss for words, Gabor, but you're struggling. No, I've been to Net Studio. We had conversations, and, you know, about yeah. this. Net shared this stuff with me. He, yeah. Yeah, and I might mention, mention that with, uh, like with Disney. Yeah. I worked for Disney Imagineering. They did theme parks. And I won't go into it, but I, anyways, because of my eyesight, everything is flat. And so my, my mind's compensated. I can eyeball things in three-point perspective pretty close. I mean, my, I don't know, I even have to hardly measure. I, and actually before that, I was doing some work for the 
nuclear industry doing complex drawings of nuclear reactors and fuel rods and can eyeball that stuff in three point. I knew there was something special about you, Nat. Yeah, we won't mention the the other word they call me for that. We'll <laughs> I told it's it's too it's too insulting to myself and others, so I won't. But I did because of that in Disney, they like this one assignment I was working for Animal Kingdom. And what they do is I've been a concept artist. They would just give me photos and uh, layouts and architectural uh, layouts and uh, I can't think of the word for it. They just give me information uh, about what they want to put in the park. And they would give me that and they have me do a huge painting of the whole park. Mm. And so I was more or less designing this park. Because this was the initial concept of where they would put, say, a tiger den, a hippopotamus pool, uh, uh, you know, different rides and monkey things and all that stuff. And I would put that in a huge painting. And they would take it back to the architects and the designers and the directors of Disney and all that. And, and they would take those and use that as a format to continue the work and develop it more. So we were really encouraged to use our imagination up to a point. You know, you, you had limitations. And that's the other thing, using this term of limitations. Uh, remember, um, uh, necessity is a mother invention. Yeah. You know, I remember that one of the most important classes I had at Art Center, I, I guess I'm wandering, but it, it is related, was a class where they gave you limitations. And you could have only see so half a building, you know, a third of a car, you know, a half of a lawn or so much. But you weren't told whether you're inside the car or upstairs in the building or up in a tree. And because of the limitations, maybe an odd side, because of those limitations, more exciting things came out of that. Because freedom, I mean, we could paint anything we want, and freedom kind of gets in the way because we're forced to create something when we're restricted. I don't think that's anything new. But if some of you haven't heard about that, think about that. If you have some restrictions and you're told to come up with something exciting, you have to use your imagination. And so you really come up with some fascinating things. And I, you know, I've kind of gotten away from that. I should do that more often. You know, some of the great exciting things you see on Pinterest or Facebook or all over the people, you know, some of them are, you know, they're not doing the Grand Canyon or the Tetons. You know, they just be maybe doing a great painting out of a pile of rags. So, but it forces you into that situation. So, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, so imagination, pushing yourself in your imagination. And um, I think that's sort of what you're leaning towards a little bit. You, uh, it depends when you're, I mean, when you're forced, not forced, but when you have a, an employer saying you got to create this, that's a different scenario too. When you're left to your, you know, your free will too. And I think that's the, um, sometimes having that freedom, I think um, sometimes we don't push ourselves hard enough to, to, to come up with um, better designs possibly because we don't have to answer per se to a boss or right. It's that's, that can get dangerous too a little bit. Yeah. Well, that's too. When I was given an assignment, when I was an illustrator doing thing for a book or magazine or whatever, they, we always did little studies. Yeah. I would, before I did a say magazine illustration, they'd tell me what they give me the story and kind of tell me what they want to emphasize. And I would always send a little color study just to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah. And even with Disney, I would do color studies and say, okay, you know, this is, is this what you're telling me? Is this what you want? Yeah. And they'll say, 
Because even in the, that process, by the time that color study is done, they might have changed their mind what they yeah. want to do. An interesting story, I, I would do these color studies, and I was doing this park in Tokyo, Tokyo Disney scene, and it, was, it recreated Italy. And I was uh, given an assignment to recreate Venice. And they wanted a night scene of Venice. And so I just kind of got, I'd been to Venice and I kind of made up this night scene with buildings lit up and gondolas and, you know, kind of a moon going down and sent it in. And, and they liked the color study so much, they decided to blow it up mm-hmm. and use it as a presentation. Mm-hmm. So where if I would have done the larger painting, I would have gotten paid about twenty twenty five thousand dollars. Instead, I only got five thousand. That's not nice. So I started doing worse color studies after that. <laughs> That's pretty. Don't make them too good. Yeah. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question that uh, once you uh, once you paint one of these scenes with the multiple figures and everything, you know, you blocked it in and you you're kind of getting done with it. Um, how much time do you spend with the painting after it's sort of done? Like what, what do you have a, not a rule, but what, what happens? Do you, I mean, do well, you need to sit on it? Do you need to, how does that, you know? Yeah. Another good question. What I, even with these color studies, I have found out no matter what I'm doing, you know, I'm working on it and I'm struggling with an area or something isn't working out or not totally I've got to get away from it. At least maybe see it a few hours later or even a day or two later. And then I get a fresh eye and I I can see what needs to be fixed or adjusted. Why do you think that happens? Like what what happens when you step away in your opinion? What what what's going on? Things you for uh, lack of an acute intelligence. <laughs> I don't know. I think we all fall victim to that, you know, and no painting's ever perfect. And, you know, sooner or later you gotta say, okay, that's that's good enough. You could fine tune the things forever and you could even ruin it. You know, so you know, I think actually it's you know, it's it is my best <laughs> answer. I heard that when the Chinese write a book, they intentionally make a couple mistakes Mm -hmm. in it so the reader doesn't feel inferior. (laughs) Interesting. So I leave those mistakes in so the viewer doesn't feel inferior. (laughs) That was not for an answer. That's a good one. (laughs) Use that right away, guys, everybody listening. Uh, (laughs) Would you say the larger the painting, the more time you need to spend with it afterwards? Oh, yeah, yeah. Kind of a good rule. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's just more ground to cover, you know, more corrections. You know, you may have to, you know, because smaller, what a, 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 a nice little bright area in a big painting may look, maybe it's too bright. It could be too dull, depending on the size and the colors it's next to. So, yeah, that, you know, everything does change bigger. You know, so you usually have to make some adjustments. And, uh, uh, you know, the best thing I can do, you know, and probably in this whole business is to get to the point you can trust your instincts. You know, it always helps to have somebody around, too, that can point things out, somebody you can trust their judgment. But, you know, and, and we're as individual artists, sometimes we're the only ones that can say, okay, that's not working not working for me somebody else may not see it but uh, if my instincts tell me something is too dark or too light or too bright or edges whatever yeah uh i try to listen to that i'm not always right but probably at least 60 70 percent yeah that's a good one something's clicking there i don't know i hear something clicking oh i probably hit Hit oh, yeah. something the desk. Sorry. What our listeners or viewers saying? What is that, Ned? What's going on? It's not on my end, so I'm clearing myself on this one. It's Ned. Ned's end. <laughs> okay. No, no, no worries. Um, so, 
Yeah, so so bigger the painting, more time you need to spend with it. Step away from it. These are big uh, things you you believe into that you yeah. you do. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it's hard for me to step away too because I've got some physical limitations, and also I can't work really large anymore. So I'm not getting up as large, and I'm not doing really big paintings. You know, so I. Uh, so I uh, need to get away. Do you sit or stand these days, or have you? I'm, usually, I'm usually sitting. Okay. Standing, I got a, you know, a bad leg and back, and it it it's pretty sore sometimes. You're so a young man. You're, you're a young man. man. You're a young man. <laughs> I look young. You're a young man. Um, what do you do you think working larger when you work in multiple figures is easier just for you personally is there do you um do you feel that it's easier or or, or what is your limitation you think when you get to be too small that you see an issue or yeah about the largest i'm doing now is maybe 16 by 20. okay 18 by 24 okay. no big huge okay things it's just too hard and I and I, I love putting pictures together I particularly these figure things I you know I just love the challenge of putting them together telling a story yeah and and, and, and even working smaller I can do more painting so it just uh, yeah, um, yeah. So there's no there's no rule in it it's just I was just asking if for you personally, I don't want anybody listening to say, hey, that said this or this. I mean, there, there really is no rule um, in it. But no, some people don't like to work small. Some yeah. people don't like to work large. Uh, yeah. You know, there's some really great paintings. Of people just work uh, smaller, you know? Yeah, I think quality definitely uh, overrules, in my opinion. Uh, but you can maybe tell us uh, of you know, versus size. I, I, I'd rather have a small gray painting than a media for, you know, large painting, so. Yeah. Painting in the wall. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, it really depends. So that's, that's, that's your process. And you, um, my, my question to, to you, um, do you, um, as, as someone is watching or listening, is, is there anyone particular or group of artists that you, you feel, or you have looked at over the years um, regarding, let's say, figurative work. Is there um, deceased? Let's go to deceased artist. Um, anyone that that you you always liked, or, or a group of artists, you know, school of artists, um, top of your head. Yeah, there's there's some there's uh, doing that. Of course, um, Soroya did multiple figures. Um, there was a, a, a Spanish painter by the name of Pradilla uh, Ordiz that okay. most people never heard of him, but he did multiple figure things. Uh, there's a there's the Prado in in um, Madrid, mm -hmm. and there's a Prado annex which most people don't know about it. They have a lot of his works. But he did, and he did little color studies, and he did these huge paintings, mm -hmm. you, know, those, you know, maybe five feet by eight feet or even larger, wow. even larger, with big scenes of a wedding wow. <laughs> or a funeral with 30, 40, 50 people, and they were incredible. Yeah. And his color studies were just wonderful. They were just lively. Yeah. Uh, uh, people like that. Sargent did multiple figure things. Uh, yeah. You know, of course, a lot of the the old illustrators. Uh, you know, yeah. Gosh, Norman right. Rockwell did that same process. Uh, Dean Cornwell. Mm -hmm. People like that did a lot of that. Uh, yeah. You know, Mancini, Baldini. You know. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot of and particularly a lot of, a lot of the Russians, yeah, you know, did wonderful multiple things. One thing added, I found out, I love to do the multiple figure things, but you know, I'm finding out they 
seemed, you know, they're a little bit harder to move. Uh, I found out just if I have two or three figures or more, for some reason, uh, as far as selling it, they seem to be more popular. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what, what that is. Maybe it's because I, you know, with multiple figure things, you have your eye going all over the place with, with less figures, you can become more focused on say one main figure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, it's like they say in the movies, you know, that's why you have stars. You know, the plot is built around one or two uh, stars or main people, and then all these other people are kind of in there. It's kind of like a Russian novel, a Russian movie. You have a cast of thousands. It can be really hard to keep track of. So it may be that kind of thinking. I don't know. Historically, do you, do you think you're seeing less, you're seeing less? multi-figure, more complex scenes now versus in the past? Is that something you... Yeah, you just don't, you don't see as much. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know yeah. why that is. I, I think uh, you, you, you do see it in, in probably more in the people that are doing real classical work. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll be doing these huge, huge, highly worked out, detailed paintings or, you know, working on a theme or some mythology where they'll have 20, 30 figures. And, um, you know, there's a few people doing them, but, um, yeah, not as many as there was. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the reason is. Okay. Uh, they, take, they take time, and they're a lot of work. Uh, so I hope it's just not that. Yeah, yeah, just interesting. Uh, I don't know, thing, things move and change all the time. Um, if there's one thing, what uh, today, uh, if someone's listening to this, if they can take away one thing, if you can recommend, if they can just do one thing that would help them in their multi-figure process, is there one, one thing? I know it's hard to nail it down to one thing, but is there something that, that, you, know, that, that you can tell someone right now? That if yeah, kind of what I mentioned earlier, don't think in details. You're doing these little valley or color studies. Think of the big color and value shape relationships. If you find yourself trying to put in an eye or nose or fingers or highlights, you're, it's in the wrong direction. The idea of these studies is to think simple. You know, Try to, try to organize it so it's not, you know, not real busy all over. You want quiet areas, busy areas, bright areas, dull areas. Uh, we only have three things to work with. We have, we can make the colors brighter or duller. We can make them darker or lighter and edges softer or sharper. When you think of it, that's all we can do to organize these studies or, or, or paintings. Uh, keep those in mind. Uh, these little studies are, you know, just for you. You know, just think of the big color shape relationships. You know, some principles of the design. I think uh, haven't got time to get into that too much here, but uh, basically an interesting arrangements of shapes and colors. Okay, that's great. That's keeping it simple. I think there's so yeah, many. That, that would apply to yeah. classical painting, traditional, even to abstracts. Uh, interesting arrangements of shapes and colors. Okay, that's great. So also, Ned, uh, you have a portrait video series with us with Tucson Art Academy online, I think, uh, since we're talking about multiple figures here. I think it definitely relates uh, to a certain degree about figures. Um, can you just kind of talk briefly about, uh, about the videos or how it would help someone if they, if they watch them? Yeah, uh, it's, it's nice to do portraits, you know, the drawings or paintings. It's not like you're having to draw the whole figure or paint the whole figure. You're just doing one simple object, the head. 
And it's not all that complicated. You know, once you, you break it down, and that's what this portrait series is about, to, sh to show you an approach that's simple and direct and that you can sharpen your eye, you can sharpen your judgment because you get the confidence that you can get a likeness. And it's, and it's the videos are broken down in the steps by step how to approach that. You know, basically like just doing the figures or studies going from large shapes to small shapes. We cover the planes of the head and how that affects values. And uh, it's, it's really good. It's a good discipline or exercise where you can really build up your skills and confidence and translates to everything else. Uh, the one thing that obvious in the portrait things is if you have strong light and shadow, if you get the shadow shape right in your portrait, you'll get a likeness. And we show all that, that process, and then taking it beyond that into half tones and uh, using uh, multiple lights to make the portrait a little bit more exciting instead of just having just one light source which gets kind of boring after a while. So we cover all that in this portrait series, and it's uh, really a nice addition for those, you know, that would like to find a way to sharpen your skills and obviously your judgment. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you, Ned, for uh, allowing us into your studio today and, uh, and giving all of us more, more knowledge. So thank you for sharing. Oh, yeah, it's delightful. I really enjoyed it, good boy. You, you, you really asked some really pertinent questions. I sure appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I try. Well, you, you, have, you have the answers. That's why we like to go to the source. So thank you, Ned. All right, Gabor. Take care. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.